I was 10 years old, and for the very first time, I heard the gospel. I, I was not raised in a Christian home by any means. In fact, really just the opposite. But then I remember at this little camp, I heard the gospel, a little 10-year-old, and I remember raising my hand and repeating the prayer and asking Jesus to come into my heart. And I didn't fully understand it all. I didn't fully understand the Bible. Um, but there was this genuine excitement for Jesus and, and for the gospel. And so I remember going to my third grade class, and there was a kid there. His name was Michael, and uh, Michael, I knew he went to church. Turns out he went to a pretty legalistic church, and one of the things that they taught at this church was that you had to be um, baptized in the name of Jesus only to be saved, and the second thing was you had to speak in tongues in order to be saved, but I didn't know all that, and so I remember sitting down with him. I'm like, hey, I just want to tell you I'm a Christian now. Um, I gave my life to Jesus, and I thought he'd be really, really excited but I'll never forget, he got this really serious expression on his face. He's like, so did you speak in tongues? And I, I had no idea what tongues was. I'm like, uh, I don't know. What is that? Sounds weird. And he, and he turned with me to Acts 2. He said, well, let me show you. And he said, there's the early church, and they're in the upper room, and they're praying together, and they're seeking God together. And then all of a sudden, that these tongues of fire came on their head. And again, I, I'm reading this you know, from a perspective of a 10-year-old. I just envisioned a massive tongue coming from the sky <laughs> and just kind of slapping people around. I'm like, that sounds really scary. And he said, well, if, if this doesn't happen to you, you're not saved. I'm like, oh no, this is horrible. So what do I do? How can this happen to me? And he says, well, we're going to pray together. And then as we pray, then, then something will happen and the tongues of fire will come upon you. So nervously, um, <laughs> I agreed. And we began to pray together and nothing happened. And we said amen, and, and he kind of looked at me like he's expecting something to happen, and nothing did. And then he asked me, he's like, is there sin in your life? I'm like, I'm only 10. Um, not that I know of. Um, <laughs> he says, well, let's pray again. So we prayed again. We spent, in my dad's workshop, uh, we spent about an hour, hour and a half or so just praying for this to happen, and nothing ever did. And so he went his way, and he's like, well, I, I don't really know if you're saving. And I was crushed. I was so devastated by this. Now, my parents, um, they were going at the time to a little church called Calvary Chapel in Southern California. And my youth pastor, he heard about this. And I had this conversation with him, and he's like, so how are you doing? I'm like, really not that good. He said, I, I don't even know if I'm saved, I told him. He's like, what? Why not? And I said, well, I haven't spoken in tongues or whatever that means. And he says, well, let me show you a few things. And he took me to Ephesians chapter 2, and this is a verse that you all know well probably, but it says, it is by grace you've been saved, not of works, lest anyone should boast. He said, Dominic, salvation is not something that you achieve, it's something that you receive. Uh, it, it's a gift. There's nothing that you can do in your own effort to make this happen. God loves you as you are. You are a Christian, you are a follower of Jesus. And I remember just being so relieved by this. And so it was as if a burden had been lifted. Now, for hundreds and hundreds of years, it, it seems that there have been people in the church who it's like their objective to try and make our relationship with God about works. Like they go around and it's as if they try and put burdens on people. Well, if you're really saved, they say, well, these are things that you should be doing. Or if you really want God to love you, if you're really spiritual like I am, then these are the things you're going to avoid or these are the directions you won't go in. And, and they're super legalistic I'm super judgmental. I like to call them sin sniffers. <laughs> so they just go around sniffing, looking for people to condemn. And they get really, really upset and really, really angry with anyone who doesn't agree with them. Now, here's the question. What does the Bible have to say about this? And uh, we deal with it in 2015, but what about the early church? Was this an issue for them as well? And the answer, as we'll see today, is a resounding yes. I want to go through Acts 15 with you. And essentially, this is a chapter where the church is trying to understand what grace is and then also trying to deal with this whole issue of legalism. Now, notice how it begins. Verse 1. It says, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch, and they were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. 
And you go down to verse 24, um, it actually says that they were, quote, disturbing the people, which was a military metaphor for an army ravaging a town. Just think of what's happening in Syria right now. So what's happening in this church, you have a whole team of people, and they're going around telling these new converts, hey, if you're not circumcised, then you're not saved. Now, this is where history is really, really helpful. What's going on here? Well, keep in mind, we're at a point in the book of Acts where the gospel is spreading all throughout the world. So it started in Jerusalem. And when it was in Jerusalem, it was primarily Jewish converts who were becoming followers of Jesus. But then as the gospel began to spread and grow, Cyprus, Lystra, Antioch, Athens, Corinth, it is now going to parts of the Roman Empire where they were primarily non-Jewish or they had pagan backgrounds. They're hearing the gospel for the very first time. They're getting really, really excited. They're joining the church, which was awesome, but there was also a lot of tension. And, and here's why. The Jewish believers they had been raised in a context where it was all about the Old Testament law, part of their culture, part of their upbringing, according to Genesis 17, says that you have to be circumcised. Circumcision for the Jewish community in the Old Testament was a physical sign of their dedication to God. And it wasn't just circumcision. In fact, if you read the Old Testament, there are 613 commandments <laughs> So there's 248 positive commandments, do this, do that, and then there's 365 negative commandments, one for every day of the year, don't do this, don't do that. So there were things you could do, couldn't do, things you could wear and couldn't wear, things you could eat and couldn't eat. They now are becoming followers of Jesus, and yet some of them were bringing all of this culture and these laws and these traditions into this New Testament church context. Some of them were so passionate about it, they go to the people in Antioch and they're like, hey, if you want to be a Christian, well, you have to be circumcised. You need to undergo this ritual if you want to be saved. Now, was this God's heart? The answer is no. In fact, when you read the Old Testament, circumcision was a covenant of grace for the Jewish people specifically. It was never intended to save them, but to set them apart from the other nations. Now, I could give a whole sermon on circumcision, but that would be weird, so we won't go there. <laughs> but the point is, they're taking this tradition and they're bringing it into the church. And what we see in the New Testament is that the, one of the purposes of the law is actually not to be an end in and of itself, but to bring us to Jesus. For those of you who are taking notes, there's a great verse in the book of Colossians chapter two, verse 17. It says that the law is a shadow, but Jesus is the reality. In other words, the law, it points us to something greater. Jesus is the substance. So what you have now is a group of people who are becoming obsessed with a shadow, but Paul and the early church leaders would argue, no, 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 you need to be more concerned about Jesus. He is the fulfillment of the law. Our focus then isn't on all these commands and all these rituals and things you, and things you shouldn't do, but rather on the person of Jesus. Make him your love, make him your identity. He's the reality, the law's a shadow. Now, by way of illustration, um, let's say after our noon gathering, um, I go home and I have like a two or three hour break before I come back here for our evening gathering. And let's just say that, that my wife, um, she hears me pull up in, in the driveway. And let's just say for sake of argument that she hears the car pull up and she's like so excited. Oh, it's my husband, he's home, I'm thrilled. And, and let's just say she opens the door and with classical music playing in the background, like a gazelle, she comes bounding towards me. <laughs> her hair flowing in the wind, the, 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 the smell of cookies wafting into my nostrils. Sweetie, I missed you. I love you, honey, I love you too. And I get out of my car and she comes rushing towards me. But let's say, instead of hugging me, she suddenly falls down and starts hugging and kissing my shadow. Dominic, oh, it's so good to see you, I love you. Kisses, hugs, and cookies. Now, I'm standing here like, okay, uh, 
That's my, that's my shadow. I'm the reality. I'm the substance. What do you do? I would be concerned on a number of levels. Like, <laughs> maybe she's a couple tacos short of a combination plate at this point. I don't know, right? But in a sense, that's what was happening to the church at Antioch. You have a whole group of people, and they're obsessed with the shadow. Circumcision, the law, these dietary regulations. And what the early church is wanting to argue is, no, 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 those things are a shadow, but the reality, the substance is Jesus. So they now are going to all these people, these legalizers, and they're saying, you need to be circumcised to be saved. Now, you can imagine that this was some pretty heavy news, especially if you're a man. Like, I'm not, you're Joe Heathen, you get saved, and then you join a church, and then they're saying, hey, um, we're glad you're here, but you gotta be circumcised. Like, wow, bummer, ouch. (laughs) You're starting to rethink the whole thing. Just imagine how weird it would be. You show up at Westside and... There's a team of ushers standing at the door. Welcome to Westside. Are you circumcised? Uh, That's awkward. Like, if not, there's a room right over here. We'll lead you. (laughs) I don't know if I want to go to this church. So this was actually a really big deal. And the early leaders, they're like, oh, dear. We we got to deal with this. So that's what this chapter is about. Beginning in verse 6, they have a discussion, debate. They realize if... If they had their way, these legalizers, this would actually contradict everything that the gospel was all about. Uh, Because the gospel was not about laws and rules and regulations, it's about grace. And it would also create this separation between Jews and Gentiles, circumcised and uncircumcised. And the point of the gospel is to tear down walls, that in Jesus there's neither Jew or Greek, slave or free, you're all one in Christ. They saw the gravity of the situation. How then do they respond? Now, this is where we get into the meat of the text. Again, fasten your seatbelt. Oh my goodness, there's a lot here. First of all, notice that they deal with the issue in community, right? They go to Jerusalem, they unpack it together, and this is a side sermon, a mini sermon, free. Here it is. That's why what we're doing today is so important. Um, There's no such thing as a lone ranger Christianity, and I know this is increasingly popular in our culture. I don't need church. I don't need other Christians. It's just me and God and nature or whatever, but actually, our theology and following Jesus is not done in a bubble. We need one another, and there is this formation of theology in our own hearts that comes when we gather and study scripture together. They recognize this, so they're like, okay, let's get together, let's unpack scripture, and then they took turns sharing. So you have Peter, verses seven through 11, and I love what he says, verse nine, he's like, God doesn't discriminate, and we shouldn't either. In verse 10, he says, their hearts are purified, not not through circumcision, but through faith. And then verse 11, he brings it home. He's like, we're saved by grace. Now, Paul shares next, verse 12. He's like, you know what? God's working in the Gentiles. I've seen it with my own eyes. There's healings. The crippled guy we saw last week, he was touched by the Lord. There's these beautiful things. It's undeniable. We cannot say that they're not part of the the kingdom of God because God's spirit is at work in them. And then James, verses 13 through 21, if you're taking notes, he quotes from the book of Amos, chapter 9. Amos, chapter 9, verses 11 and 12, and he says, we're in the new covenant. And because of that, both Jews and Gentiles together share in the messianic blessing. We're united. And verse 19, he says, if this is God's future, then we should live that out in the present. Now, let's take it deeper. Verses 20 and 21, James makes a proposition. (laughs) This is really interesting. He says, instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from the meat of strangled animals and from blood. The rest of the apostles are like, that sounds good. They write a letter And then they tell the people in Antioch, hey, you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. And verse 31 kind of cracks me up because it says the people were really glad. (laughs) As you can imagine, praise God. But then they give them four things that they (laughs) were to avoid. 
So I, I want to pause here because this is where it can get confusing. This is where we just got to focus in because we talked about it's by grace that we're saved, not by works. The Jerusalem church affirmed this. They're like, we should not put burdens on the Gentiles. So if that's true, why then would they give them these four things to avoid? Why would they say, okay, you're saved by grace, don't worry about circumcision, but stay away from food polluted by idols, sexual immorality, the meat of strangled animals, and blood. What on earth is going on here? Two thoughts to share with you, and hopefully this will clarify some of the ambiguity that is in this passage. Number one, they ask the church in Antioch to do this for the sake of culture. How so? Last week we talked about Roman culture was deeply, deeply polytheistic. So people are worshiping gods and goddesses, and part of the process of worshiping all these idols, and this was common in Antioch, is that you would take, if you were Joe heathen, you would take your animal to the temple and you'd kill it. You would take a third of the meat and you would give it to the priests. You would take a third of the meat and sacrifice it on an altar. And a third of the meat was sold in the local marketplace at a discounted rate, typically a really good cut of meat. Then what they would do is inside these temples were temple prostitutes, both male and female. And you would then go in and part of the worship act, many, many people culturally accepted, is that you would then engage in sexual activity with these temple prostitutes. Again. This is a part of their culture. No one thought anything about it. It was widely accepted. And this happened in Antioch. So the early church, the leaders are like, okay, you're saved by grace, but we're making a very strong recommendation to you that you avoid these things. And here's why. Because these things can harm you, that they can hurt you. Now, how can they harm you? Well, let's just begin with the obvious one, sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, is a sin. Um, whether it's fornication, adultery, uh, pornography. In fact, the word sexual immorality in the Greek is the word porneia in the Greek. It's where we get our word pornography. So the church leaders are saying, we're telling you, abstain from this. Stay away from pornography. Stay away from sexual immorality. It's gonna wreck you, it's gonna destroy you, it's gonna warp your mind. And then they tell them the prohibition against these certain kinds of foods. Now, again, if you're taking notes, we have it there on the screen. First Corinthians chapter eight, the Apostle Paul goes deeper into this. And, and what he says there in 1 Corinthians 8 is he's talking about what happened in the temples when people would go in and worship these idols. And Paul makes this argument. He says, when you go into a place like that, you're stepping into enemy territory. He says a statue, it's more than a statue. It's more than stone. It's more than wood. He says behind that are very real demonic uh, things, entities that can hurt you and corrupt you and wound you. And so he says, stay away from those places because it will have an impact on your life. And that's why in our own life, there may be places where you feel justified to go. Well, the Bible doesn't say I can't go there or watch this or whatever. But could it be that there's something there that demonically, spiritually is gonna affect you and tear you down. So this is just common sense 101. There are some things in life where maybe the Bible doesn't specifically say, thou shalt not do X, but when you go there, you know it's grieving the spirit of God. Let me just give you a couple real practical examples. Um, so I talked to a guy recently struggles with alcoholism, and I've walked with him on this journey for a few years now. Sometimes he's up, sometimes he's not, sometimes he's doing good, sometimes he's not doing good. It's been a constant addiction and a, and a battle. A few months ago, he found himself unemployed, and so he's been searching for work. A few weeks ago, comes up to me, he's like, hey, Dom, I found a job, and I'm so excited about this. I'm like, cool, where is it? He said, well, it's at a bar downtown Portland. I'm like, no! 
that's not wise. Like you're struggling with this. This is an issue in your life. And sure enough, over the last few weeks, it's brought him down. He's really, really struggled. Don't put yourself in a place where you know that the enemy can begin to tear your soul apart. Um, here's another example. Let's say you're dating someone and you're really attracted to this person. You love this person and there, there, maybe there's a temptation sexually. It probably wouldn't be wise to say, hey, sweetie, come over to my house tonight, my roommates are gone, you know, let's just snuggle together, Netflix and chill, <laughs> no big deal, right? Now, does the Bible say thou shalt not watch Netflix? No, but you're putting yourself in a place where you know it can hurt you. And that's where these prohibitions or recommendations of the early church, they're saying this is common sense. These are things, we don't want you to go into these dark places. You've been rescued from that. God brought you out of that lifestyle. You may think you're strong, I can handle this, not a big deal. You go there and it could become a big deal. It could hurt you. So we begin with the, the cultural context. For the sake of the culture in which they live, they say these are things we recommend that you avoid. Number two, let's take it deeper. They make these recommendations for the sake of others. Now, this is huge. For your average Gentile who had probably never read the Old Testament, didn't know the Old Testament, then becomes a Christian and goes into the church, for them, um, eating meat was not a big deal that was sacrificed to idols. They're like, so what? It's just sirloin. <laughs> big deal. Like, it's not gonna affect me. But for the Jewish people that were in this crowd, that were in these churches, this would have been deeply, deeply offensive. And here's why. For thousands and thousands of years, the Jewish people, they were dedicated to the law, to purity, to traditions, and it wasn't for them just a matter of taste. This was integral to their survival as a culture and their identity as a culture. I mean, the Jewish culture is so beautiful. For thousands and thousands of years, they've been able to maintain their ethnicity and identity even though historically they've been swallowed up by all these other nations. And one of the reasons why is because of their strict observance of the law. So you can imagine now for the Jewish people, they come into a church and you have a group of people who are eating together because they love to eat. And all of a sudden they're passing around this meat that had been offered to an idol. This was like a punch in the gut to them. This was in effect saying, you know what? We don't really care about your Jewish history or your identity. We just care about good sirloin, pass the A1, like get over it, deal with it. You're just legalistic. And what the apostles are saying is, no, that's the wrong attitude. For the sake of love, for, for the sake of unity in the church, they say you should stay away from these things. Now, let's bring it all together real quick. The way that the early church dealt with this issue that was coming into the church at Antioch, be circumcised to be saved. The leaders say, no, you're saved by grace, not circumcision. But then they bring the Gentiles to a place of sensitivity and love for the Jewish community. Now, maybe some of you are wondering, okay, Dom, what on earth does this have to do with me today? Like, really? Circumcision? and strangled animals, like <laughs> when was the last time you had a heated discussion with someone on Facebook about offering a cow to Zeus or circumcision? Like these aren't necessarily culturally relevant things, or are they? In fact, I wanna argue that what we have here is actually deeply relevant and can actually revolutionize the way that we treat one another and the way we understand what grace is all about. So there's one more passage I want you to turn to and we'll be done. Turn with me to Romans chapter 14. And by the way, you guys have been amazing today. I know this is a ton of stuff, so thank you for that. Thank you for your grace. But Romans 14 is the key. It's where we make the bridge from the first century to 2015. Paul begins the chapter and he's talking about the same issue. Should we have food that's been offered to idols? And look at how he begins, verse one. He says, we shouldn't quarrel over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. 
as a meat eater, I love that verse. <laughs> Praise God. He who's weak eats only vegetables. Biblical evidence for five guys right here. I'm just saying. <laughs> now, when it comes to Christian ethics, are there some things that are really, really clear? Yeah. We talked about the sexual immorality. That's very clear. Pornography, adultery, stealing, violence, foul language, drunkenness, being a Royals fan. Like, all, all these things are like black and white, right? Scripturally, it, it's, all, it's all right there. No, but there are other things that maybe aren't so clear. And for those of you who like to take notes, grab a pen, piece of paper, underline that phrase where it says disputable matters. There are some things that we call disputable matters. What are disputable matters? They are things that may be culturally accepted, but Christians are divided on. Or you could just write down gray areas. Now, what are some gray areas? I could give you a ton. Let me just give you a few. One, how much alcohol is appropriate to drink? I've been in Portland now for a few years, and I've quickly learned in Portland, it's a non-issue. <laughs> People really don't struggle with this. Um, but I spent a year in North Carolina. Oh my goodness, it is a big issue. Like if you're a Christian, you don't drink. You don't even talk about alcohol. Like this is off the table. It's a, they struggle with this. It's a deep, deep issue for them. Or if you go to other parts of the world, I, I spend a lot of time in the South Pacific. Hey, if you drink there, like that is a real stumbling block for some people. Or parts of Asia, the same thing is true. And then you go to England, and it's a completely different experience entirely. So this is something where, and I imagine in this room, there's probably some differences of opinion, how much alcohol is appropriate to drink. Um, here's another one. Maybe it's in the area of entertainment. So when does a movie or a song cross a line and begin to grieve the heart of God? Now, you all know what I'm talking about. Like, have you ever been in the movie theater and then you just start to feel uncomfortable. You're like, oh, this is kind of weird. I don't know if I should be here. Here's another one. How do we define modesty? The Bible says be modest. Well, how do you define that? <laughs> and the thing is, my goodness, you go to different cultures and different parts of the world, and there's some different views on this. So when I was in the Middle East a few years ago, um, our brothers and sisters in the Middle East are extremely modest, and most of the women wear uh, these head coverings, not as a legalistic thing, but just a, as a beautiful way to be modest, and, they, and they, it's part of their culture too. In fact, in Islamic culture, it's the same thing. I'll never forget um, in, in this uh, Muslim city, I was taking a taxi, and <laughs> there was a, a group of women uh, standing on the corner and about to cross the street or something, and they were veiled from head to toe, like you couldn't see anything. And the taxi driver, he undoes his window and whistles at them. And I'm like, <laughs> nice ankles? Like <laughs> but then you go to Hawaii. So I, I was a pastor in Hawaii for eight years. I'd be preaching, people come in in their swimsuits. That's just totally normal. So how do you define modesty? I spent time in the South Pacific again, Vanuatu, and wearing shirts for women is not a thing there. But showing your knees, oh my goodness, that's a big stumbling block for guys. So what do we do with this, <laughs> right? Here's another one. Finances, what do we do with our money? How do we steward our money? These are gray areas. How do we navigate through these gray areas? That's the heart of Acts 15. That's the heart here of, of Romans 14. But I wanna share with you a verse in Romans 14 that takes everything we've been talking about today and boom, it just nails it. So if you like to underline stuff, underline this verse, verse 13, or if you're into tattoos, get it tattooed in Hebrew on your arm. You're like, Dominic, Tattoos are of the devil. Okay, well, here it is. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. My goodness, that's it right there. How so? Paul addresses two groups of people, the same two groups we saw in Acts 15. We have the legalists, be circumcised, speak in tongues, 
pray this much per day, read the Bible this much per day, you have to do this, you have to do that. And then you have the liberalists. People are like, hey man, anything goes. Chill, relax, I'm free in Christ. Paul addresses both people. What does he say to the legalist? Don't be judgmental of others. Paul's like, that's not your job. Everyone's going to give account of themselves for God. You're not going to give account for your brother. You're going to stand before God and give account. Don't feel that you have to micromanage everyone's life. Now, obviously, if it's a sin, yes, you speak into that. But he's like, let God do that. Now, I think for most of us, probably 90% of us, we love this part. We're like, oh my gosh, yeah, man, don't judge me. Like, don't be legalistic. Like, it's part of our American, just rugged individualism, although I'm British, but I have the same mentality too. It's like, hey, we don't like being judged. But then it gets a little convicting because he talks to the liberalists and he says, now, for those of you who don't see anything wrong with what you're doing, he says, I actually want you to rethink that. And the way he puts it is, don't put a stumbling block or an obstacle in the way of your brother or sister. In other words, yeah, you may be free in Christ to do all those things. You may have liberties in that area, but more important than your liberty is your love for your brother or sister. So, so if there's someone in your life, and I wanna say who's close to you, so it could be a husband, a wife, a spouse, someone you're dating, a, a child, a parent, whatever, someone who's close to you, and maybe they truly, deeply struggle because of what you're doing. And you've been making all these arguments, I'm free in Christ, roommate, just get over it. But you know it's actually affecting them, and it's hurting them, what Paul is saying is for the sake of that person, you need to rethink it and be willing to give it up. Now, Paul, obviously, is not just talking about food here. He's talking about anything that may get in the way of putting others and the gospel first. And there's tons of examples of this in scripture. Let me just give you three if you note takers. Here's one, um, Acts 16, we'll see next week. It says that Timothy, he's like a 30-year-old man, and it says he was circumcised. He chose to be circumcised. Why? Did he wanna be? No. <laughs> but he chose to be for the sake of the Jewish people that he wanted to reach. He's like, okay, I wanna reach this group of people. I'm willing to go through this so that I can be a better witness to them. Ooh, here's one, Acts 21. Paul shaved his head. Now, why would Paul shave his head? Well, it was to reach the Jewish people again. Now, I imagine Paul didn't want to shave his head. He probably liked his mullet or whatever, right? He's like, I don't want to do this. But he did it because he wanted to reach a certain group of people. Um, here's a classic one, Jesus in Matthew 17. There's a group of people that come up to him. They're like, hey, Jesus, um, do you pay taxes to the temple? And Jesus is kind of sarcastic. He is sarcastic from time to time. He's like, should I have to pay taxes to myself? It's like, this temple's kind of for me, right? And he could have just left it at that. He had a really good point. Hey, I'm free, don't judge me. But what does he say? He says, lest they be offended. I don't want to offend them. I will do it. And so he sends Peter on this fishing trip. It's a really cool story. Peter goes fishing, finds a coin, and he pays the temple tax. What you see in scripture is that whenever there is a conflict between liberty and love, Love takes precedence. Check out this quote. Um, it's genius, and we don't know who wrote it. We, I thought it was Augustine, but in fact, we don't know. It says this, in essentials, there must be unity. In non-essentials, there must be liberty. But in all things, there must be charity. That is so stinking good. That's the message right there. I, I, I wanna close, I wanna ask you three questions. And my guess is, in some way, one of these questions are gonna apply to some of us today. Here's the first one. Are there any areas in your life that God is calling you to give up for the sake of others? And you've had your arguments, and you've said, I have every right to do this, to go to that place, or watch that stuff, or be in those environments. Not a big deal for me. The Bible doesn't say it's wrong. You've had arguments with people about it. 
But there's someone who's close to you right now. Maybe it's your husband. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's your roommate. And they're actually really struggling because of that. And it's actually hurting them. What would it look like for you to say, you know what, I can give up those freedoms for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of love. <laughs> it's not about me. And I'm willing to give that up so that others can be mentored and discipled and loved and shown the love of Jesus. Here's another question. Are there any areas in your life where maybe God is calling you to a conviction? This is important. Um, I think there are times where God will give you a conviction about something and technically it's not a sin, but for you it is a sin because God told you don't do it. <laughs> Has that ever happened to you? Um, a few weeks ago I ran into a guy and he said, hey Dom, hey check out my new cell phone. He's like really excited about it. I thought he's gonna whip out the latest iPhone or something and he pulls out of his phone this 1982 flip phone and it's super archaic. He's like, check it out. And it has these little things, buttons on it and I'm like, what? I don't, why? And he said, here's why. He said, I had the iPhone, I had the smartphone, but it was becoming a huge distraction for me. He says, I was spending so much time on it. It was actually costing me at work. It was costing me time with my kids. It was costing me relational investment with my spouse. I was on it all the time. It was like an addiction to me. He said, there were times where I was just struggling with temptation and looking at things online on it that I shouldn't have been. And he said, I've been wrestling with this for some time and God spoke to my heart, you need to give that up. For him, it's a conviction that the Spirit of God spoke into his heart and for him, it would be a sin to go back. This is something God has shown him until God shows him otherwise. Now, is there something in your life where maybe no one else in your life gets it? <laughs> they may think you're weird. What, you don't wanna go to the pub with us? You don't wanna watch that movie with us? You don't wanna listen to that stuff with us? And you have a conviction about it. I just wanna encourage you with that. Whatever it may be, even if no one else in your life gets it, even if no one else in your life think, they think you're weird or backwards or bizarre, stand your ground. Do what God's called you to do. Don't judge them because they're not doing You do what God has called you to do. Is there a conviction in your life that God is calling you to stand up for? Number three, are there any areas in your life where maybe you have been legalistic? You know, I began the message by saying this happens in any church. My guess is that there's probably some wounded people. Even in this gathering, you've come from a legalistic background. We've all known people who are super legalistic. Um, a friend of mine told me a story. There was a guy standing on a bridge, and another guy was walking up to him, and he thought the guy was about to jump. And so he's like, don't jump! And the guy's like, okay. <laughs> and he just played along with it. He's like, Why? He said, well, there's so much to live for. He said, like what? He said, are you a Christian? He said, yeah, me too. Are you Catholic or Protestant? Like I said, well, I'm, I'm Protestant. He's like, oh, that's awesome, me too. What are the chances? Are you Episcopalian or Baptist? Like I was like, I'm Baptist, me too, so cool. Are you Baptist Church of God or Baptist Church of the Lord? And the guy's like, well, I'm Baptist Church of the Lord. Me too, wow, are you original Baptist Church of the Lord or Reformed Baptist Church of the Lord? And he's like, well, I'm, I'm Reformed Baptist Church of the Lord. And he's like, oh, cool, me too. Are you Reformed Baptist Church of the Lord, Reformation of 1917, or Reformed Baptist Church of the Lord, Reformation of 1928? And the guy said, I'm Reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1928. And the guy said, die, heretic, and pushed him off the edge. <laughs> now that didn't happen. I like, don't worry, like, oh, that's so horrible. But it happens in the church. It happens in our own life, right? Where we go around and we judge people. Now, have there been any areas in your life where you've been the sin sniffer? <laughs> where you've been the one quick to condemn and point the finger, well, you don't pray like I do. You don't read the Bible like I do. You don't have the same convictions that I do. What would it look like for you to return to the simplicity and the beauty of grace? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? is freedom. One last thought, and my guess is, is that this applies to many of us. Maybe you're not the person going around judging people. You're not the sin sniffer, <laughs> but you're really, really hard on yourself. 
Like you are judgmental of yourself. You're beating yourself up. I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy enough. You're super critical of yourself. And to be honest, this is something I really, really wrestle with. Just yesterday, honestly, going through this whole passage and going over my notes, I'm like, oh, I don't even know if I can teach this. Just feeling really condemned. Monday morning is like my big pastor hangover time. Like I said, what? I just struggle with this and constantly beating myself up. And just yesterday, I was sitting in my car and it's like appropriately raining. I'm like, God, circumcision. Like what on earth am I going to say? And the Lord spoke to my heart and he's like, Dom, because that's what he calls me. Um, <laughs> You're saved by grace. When, when, when I'm beating myself up, when, when you are overly critical, when, when you allow all your mistakes and failures to define your identity, it's because you don't fully get grace yet. It's almost like a weird form of legalism. But the beauty of the gospel is that Jesus has taken all of your sin and all of your failure and all of your mistakes and all of those things that you wish you could undo. He died for it. He bled for it. He took that addiction you had, the divorce you went through, the struggle that you've had in your own mind, whatever it is, he took it. His hands and his feet were pierced. He bled for it. And not only did he take your sin and your failure, but the Bible also said that the righteous requirements of the law were put on him. Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. And now the Bible says you are in Jesus. In other words, God looks at you today and he doesn't see your failure and he doesn't see your mistakes and your inability and inadequacy to keep the law because none of us can. He looks at you and says, you are the righteousness of God. You are holy. You are pure. You are clothed. There is nothing that you can do to make God love you more. There's no failure that you may have done that would make God love you less. You are loved with an unending love and nothing, height, depth, angels, principalities, powers, your past, those people in your life, your struggle, that addiction, nothing can separate you from the love of God that is in Jesus. And when we understand that love, it changes everything. Because all of a sudden, Lord, I want to live for you. And I want to do the right thing. Not because there's someone telling me, do this and do that. But because I'm so passionate about you. And when you're in love with someone, you want to give to that person your 